Corn School on realagriculture.com is brought to you by Veltima Fungicide and Pride Seeds. For Real Agriculture, I'm Kelvin Hepner at uh, the Crop Connect Conference in Winnipeg and pleased to be joined now by uh, Manitoba Agriculture's soil duo, soil team. I'm not sure what their title is. It's Marla Rickman and uh, and John Hurd. And uh, soil acidity is something that we haven't often talked about, especially in the eastern side of the prairies. Uh, what do we know in t- about uh, soil acidity in terms of potentially new information that's coming to light, Marla? Oh, well, I mean, it really depends on, like, we're starting to see these problems. We recognize that we may see salinity where we have sandier soils. That's really where that acidity is building up, or at least where we start seeing that acidity problem. And then you add in the fact that from the fertilizer standpoint, where we're dealing with sandy soils and, say, high-end using crops, meaning high-end fertilization on those crops, then we start to see further acidification happening on those soils. We often aren't actually identifying them very well or identifying patches of cylind- or um, of pH uh, and acidity in the soil because of the fact that we do composite sampling. So when you do composite sampling, quite often we're not capturing the full variability that's happening because pH varies a ton across fields and we don't see that unless we're actually sampling specific areas. And as that acidity is actually building up, we start seeing the crop suffer, and that can be something that now we know we have to take action on. Okay. So maybe it's not new information, but we're now acknowledging that we have some issues with acidity, at least in in patches, John. Yeah. Uh, People don't want to let unproductive acres persist out there, and I think that's what Marla's talk was. You know, if you've got areas that are unproductive, uh, first, before you fix them, figure out what's going on because you talked about a lot of things like there's erosion there's salinity Uh, well down the list is probably acid soils but uh, a soil test will get you there to know whether that's your issue Mm -hmm. we've been seeing a lot of people do the wrong fix on the wrong problem so uh, uh, starts with the soil test and uh, interesting some of the acidic soils we've been out looking at, they were never identified as acidic soils. They thought it was herbicide carryover or something else was, or, or seed seed burn damage. Something else was going on until the soil test was done and then the aha, okay, now we're dealing with something else. So when you see these areas, Marla, do you ask for a specific soil test result for just that sample or, or how, do you, how, should, how should a grower react to this or handle this? Well, I mean, if we're talking about something like pH, obviously that's one of those standard things that we're looking at and we might be looking at, you know, topsoil and subsoil just to see, you know, oh, it's changing in that topsoil again. That's where the fertilizer is being added. So therefore, that's where we start seeing that acidity starting to kind of show and build up. Um, but when you're seeing something like what John was, what we were talking about in the presentation and, and this kind of case study that John had brought forward, the crop is suffering. And so now we're trying to figure out why the crop is suffering. And so in the case of what we were talking about today, it looked like a manganese, defi- or a, um, manganese uh, toxicity problem, so too much manganese, and something that you normally won't see in a field but can see when you've got these high acidic issues. And so the crop is suffering, it's not doing very well. We can take a soil test, but we also need to go out and take a tissue test to actually determine you know, what's happening to the, um, to the plant itself. But important not to just go in in any of these cases where you have like a good area and a bad area or a bad area and a less bad area. Um, You want to go in and you take the soil samples and the tissue samples in each of those areas to compare against each other. And that is a critical part of that diagnosis. Does it also sometimes show up as an aluminum toxicity issue? Yeah, so in uh, cases like that, aluminum toxicity will end up being a problem in an acid soil as well. Uh, and so in this case, it was kind of hard to tell sometimes whether it's just it's aluminum versus just manganese. The manganese is very high in the affected plants uh, in this particular case. Um, but the aluminum doesn't, it's high too, but it doesn't get quite as high because aluminum tends yeah. to like and, and burn off the ends. Yeah, and, and it's never, uh, aluminum isn't a normal test. Mm-hmm. But yeah. manganese is. So manganese gives you a hint. Well, the pH and manganese gives you a hint and it's only after further questioning you know the lab says you know it's probably aluminum playing a part too and and we know that from basic chemistry courses we teach is that as we get to acidic soils those are culprits Uh, they also cause a a, a cascade of other issues too like hard phosphorus fixation things like this so uh, yeah first the, the reason we identify these places the crops doing poor And that just prompts, you know, investigative uh, scouting to answer the problem. 
Speaking of basic chemistry, John, why do high nitrogen using crops uh, increase? What, what's the correlation with that in uh, acidity? Okay. Explain that in the explain well, that chemistry. Well, it would be uh, uh, nitrogen as, as ammonium fertilizers as they convert to nitrate. Ammonium, I hate for the chemistry lesson, but there's three, well, there's four H's on ammonium, and that's converting to nitrate, NO. So those hydrogens are going somewhere. Hydrogen is acidity. Yeah. And so uh, uh, they impart uh, acidity in the soil, and quite often the, in many of our high pH soils, that, that, that's just neutralized by the tons and tons of calcium carbonate that are in our soil. But if we have neutral pH soils or slightly acidic soils or, or sandy soils without much buffering capacity. Those tend to be the soils where you also grow potatoes and corn and, and use nitrogen. And so uh, once we start budging down the pH, uh, uh, our, our crop systems can move that further. I should mention, Marla mentioned about testing soil pH in the top six inches and below. Uh, you know, some of the work from elsewhere in Iowa, we bore, uh, they say, you know, response to uh, lime could be strong if you've got acidic topsoil and acidic subsoil. Some, uh, quite often, we'll test in the subsoil will still be calcareous or alkaline. Mm -hmm. And so we, we wouldn't expect the same amount of uh, correction or, or, or the same amount of problem if that's the case. So what do you recommend? I'm not sure who sh I should ask. What is the, the plan of action if you identify one of these patches? Uh, well, well I, the, of course, we don't know. Well, we do kind of know. But, but that's why we asked uh, uh, Ryan Buto from North Dakota State University to come up and share the near U.S. experiences. They're seeing this advancing a lot faster in parts of North Dakota and Montana under traditional zero-till conditions where they broadcast urea fertilizer and they find they're acidifying the surface of the soil, it's the top two, two inches, but it's having major impact. Uh, Thankfully, most of our farmers are not broadcasting nitrogen. They're banding it deeper, so we wouldn't avoid that. But we don't know that, that what they're experiencing, we will experience at some point. And the, the cure, the fix is limestone, but that's expensive and access is limited right now. Uh, one of the first steps that they do, one of the first impacts of, of acid source is, is low phosphorus. So you could, in the meantime, just bump up your phosphorus nutrition uh, while, while you prepare yourself to access some um, industrial lime byproduct. Uh, uh, you know, we're surrounded by limestone in Manitoba. They mine it in Stonewall, but nobody there wants to grind it to the fineness mm -hmm. it needs to be for liming, until at least there's a big business doing that. Yeah. Then they'll do that. But at this point, we're seeing just pockets you know, yeah. of problems. Okay. Oh, one more one thing. thing, John. Yeah, yeah, wood ash. That's yeah. the cure. Yeah. You know, I spent a lot of time in northern Ontario doing that, and we do have wood ash uh, from some of our uh, industrial suppliers up at uh, Louisiana Pacific. They're using wood ash to address some of the acidic soils up that way. So the byproducts are probably the first place to start to see which of the byproducts might, industrial byproducts might be available to help neutralize. I also wanted to add around the phosphorus thing, John, um, placement of it, right? Not mm -hmm. just about bumping up those rates, but you know that if you're in a situation where you've got a soil that's Here's a bound farmer right here that has used wood ash to, to fix the kelp. <laughs> Acid the kelp soils. soils, totally so. different acid soil problem. Um, <laughs> yeah. I'm not saying I'm not sandy, um, but when you're dealing with these, you know, with these soils that have a high tendency to kind of tie up phosphorus, placement of that becomes key too, and not like broadcasting, tilling it in, that type of thing, getting that good uh, good seed. Seed clo close, close to, to seed, seed kind of placement of phosphorus becomes really critical, just like the same ways when we're dealing with higher pH soils, right? Again, those soils are tend they tend to kind of tie up phos, so placement is really critical. All right. Well, it's certainly something that we should have on our radars. It sounds like even if we until now didn't acknowledge we had this issue yeah. here, we can acknowledge it now. Yeah. 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 Thank you, Marla and John, for your for your time and your insight again today. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.